This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Githu Yuat. It's Thursday, January 23rd. This is Africa 54. As global fear of the deadly coronavirus heightens, Nigeria starts temperature screenings at Lagos International Airport. Bite by bite, veganism grows on the meat-loving citizens of South Africa. And Kenya Stock Exchange sees a boost from the repeal of a rate cap. The deadly coronavirus has killed at least 17 people, all in China's Hubei province, according to Chinese authorities. Officials say most of the patients who died also had other health issues, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and coronary heart disease. But global fear that the disease is rapidly spreading is now affecting airport operations in Africa's most populous country. Nigeria, China's top African trading partner, began using temperature monitors on Wednesday to check passengers arriving at the Lagos International Airport. Angela Okomadu begins our coronavirus coverage. Nigeria has begun screening passengers arriving into Lagos Airport as fears increase that China's deadly new coronavirus is rapidly spreading. Health officials in Nigeria, China's top African trading partner, began using temperature monitors on Wednesday, checking passengers from China and other high-risk departure zones. It's a move welcomed by banker Akim Oyewole. I was impressed because I was also already thinking in my mind that how Nigeria is getting prepared for this new outbreak of virus uh, that's already been reported in China. And I hope we are as prepared as we were during the Ebola crisis. Lagos's airport manager Shin Arba Victoria said Nigeria was more prepared to monitor outbreaks in airports because of the Ebola epidemic, as that was when passenger screenings were set up. To us, the coronavirus wasn't just a new thing or a big deal because we have a system in place. Deaths from the flu like virus rose to 17 on Wednesday. The previously unknown coronavirus strain is believed to have emerged from an animal market in central Chinese city. Officials suspect it originated from illegally traded wildlife. Angela Okumadu of Reuters with that report. As the coronavirus spreads within and outside of China, health officials are scrambling to contain it. But the virus is so new, not much is known about it. VOA's Carol Pearson tells us what we do know about the deadly disease. People from China are being screened at airports, both in their country and abroad. They're being checked for fever and other symptoms of a new respiratory virus. The virus is a coronavirus, so-called because it appears to be surrounded by a crown. The common cold is one example of a coronavirus, and so are deadly respiratory viruses like SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. It originated from animals, civets, at a food market in China. Then came another coronavirus, the Middle East respiratory virus known as MERS. MERS probably was from bats, but now is endemic in camels all over the Middle East and spreading from camels to humans. So for all of these emerging coronaviruses, they all have an, an intermediate host that jumps, that allows the virus to jump from animals to people. This latest coronavirus is associated with a food market in Wuhan, a city of 11 million people. Respiratory viruses are airborne, transmitted by coughing or sneezing, touching an infected surface, and then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes. Freeman says it's easier to catch a coronavirus than it is to catch Ebola, which spreads by bodily fluids. So far, this new virus doesn't seem to target any one group, but age has its disadvantages. If you're elderly, 65 or older, you have a greater chance of complications. But there's no age restriction on this. Complications can include pneumonia, bronchitis, kidney failure, fluid buildup in the lungs, and death. If you wind up getting a secondary bacterial infection, you can get put on an antibiotic. If you have respiratory distress and you need help with breathing, you could be put on a respirator. 
but there is no proven specific effective treatment for the novel coronavirus. Scientists around the world are studying this virus. What we need to know next is uh, where the virus came from. And then the next steps are really looking at uh, what this virus does, how it causes disease. Can we uh, develop diagnostics to the virus so we can better understand how it spreads in the community? In the meantime, the CDC recommends frequent hand washing, coughing into your elbow or a tissue, and if you suspect you have the virus, contacting a doctor. Carol Pearson, VOA News, Washington. Residents of three Greek islands staged a protest Wednesday against the overcrowding of refugee camps and to demand government action to ease migrant pressure. Most stores were closed and public services were halted on the islands of Lesbos, Chios and Samos, where some refugees camps have more than 10 times the number of people they were built for. VOA's Ladzahok has more on the simmering migrant tension. A day of protests was organized by regional governors and mayors who are traveling to Athens on Thursday to present their demands to the government. An estimated 10,000 people joined the demonstration on three Greek islands. The migrants should go. We are not racists. Simply the situation on Lesbos is completely out of control. They are coming and they are not leaving. Open the borders so they can go to Italy, Bulgaria, Germany and close the borders because the island cannot take more, neither Lesbos, nor Kios, or Samos. Local officials say the protest is a loud and clear message that the situation on the islands of the North Aegean can no longer be tolerated by residents or by migrants. The piling up and the entrapment of so many thousands of people in awful conditions of living cannot continue. Our humanity cannot accept this. And the erosion of the islanders' way of living after such a big crowd has been gathered up is intolerable. The United Nations Refugee Agency says there are about 100,000 migrants and refugees in Greece, with close to 40,000 on the islands. Moria camp on Lesbos is severely overcrowded. With a capacity for 3,000, it is housing about 19,000 people, according to the government figures. There are reports of deaths due to accidents, illness or violence. For family, it's uh, not very difficult. It's a night it's to go to WC. It's uh, very dangerous. Migrants have staged their own protests, most recently at Moria on Friday, where a migrant from Yemen had been stabbed to death. Greece has appealed to other European countries to help ease the burden. Europe urgently needs a common policy in response to the new needs. France has offered to help Greece organize flights that will return rejected asylum seekers to their country of origin. With the help of Frontex, we will be able to organize Franco-Greek flights. So this is something extremely important. It is an important measure. Migrants from Africa, Central Asia and the Middle East often travel to Turkey en route for Western Europe and the three Greek islands closest to Turkey are their first port of entry into Europe. As more and more European countries close their borders to them, migrants remain in Greece, placing an extraordinary burden on the small Mediterranean country. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. The United Nations International Court of Justice handed down a big decision on Thursday ordering Myanmar to take all necessary steps to ensure the safety and prevent any acts of genocide against Rohingya Muslims, the ethnic group that was forced to flee their homes during a violent military crackdown in 2017. The court says that its order to protect the Rohingya is binding and creates international legal obligations on Myanmar. Myanmar is expected to report to the court on its progress of complying with its order. Gambia brought the case to the tribunal, the United Nations highest court on behalf of the 57 nation organization of Islamic cooperation, hoping to hold Myanmar accountable for what UN officials have called a genocide carried out against the Rohingya. Now, efforts by conservationists in Sudan are underway as they try to save four lions they say have been underfed and neglected in a wildlife park in Khartoum after one lion died earlier this week. 
The emaciated lions belong to an important subspecies that exists only in limited areas, including southeast Sudan and neighboring Ethiopia, according to Halda Saliman Magub of the Sudan Wildlife Research Center. It is unclear exactly where the lions had come from, but the cages in Al Qureshi Park, where they were being kept, had been constricting their movement. The lions are now being treated after a plea from the Sudan Wildlife Research Center and an online campaign pointing out their plight. Al Qureshi Park receives few tourists and little revenue. Veganism is spreading among South Africa's young, socially aware residents who note that their quest to eliminate animal products from their diets is provoking interesting arguments about the role of meat in African culture and spirituality. VOS Anita Powell takes a look at the new wave of Afri-vegans from Johannesburg. Plant-based foods are getting a bigger place at the table in meat-loving South Africa as more and more people experiment with vegetarian and vegan lifestyles. Veganism, which entails cutting out all meat and animal-derived products, is slowly growing globally. A Google Trends report puts South Africa as ranking 14th globally in searches for vegan, the only African nation to rank so high. While there is no official count of how many vegans are in South Africa, the interest has led to a sprouting of vegetarian and vegan restaurants in Johannesburg, the nation's economic hub. And this year, Africa's first large-scale vegan and plant-based exposition will land in Cape Town. Many new vegans cited moral and health reasons, like financial advisor Dialan Nayagar, who made the switch last year. And I got introduced to this whole new way of eating, uh, you know, healthy eating, organic-type food uh, from plants, and I couldn't believe it. Um, like I said, it blew my mind, and I got fully involved into it, and uh, haven't turned back. Eh? But say the owners of one of Johannesburg's hippest, newest vegan eateries, vegans don't have to explain themselves to anyone. All I'm trying to do is live a life that's sustainable for me, and that makes me happy. Her business partner, Anesum Vizo, who is also a medical doctor, says that most people cite health reasons for the switch. Meat is full of saturated fat, and saturated fat is a huge cardiovascular risk. It leads to heart attacks, strokes, it's been implicated in diabetes as well, and your veggies and your fruit don't have that, so or have very low levels of that. So I think in terms of that, if you're eating the correct portion um, and you're eating the right thing, then totally a vegan lifestyle can definitely be healthier than, than a meat-based meat -based diet. But veganism can be a lonely road. Many South Africans we approached expressed horror at the thought of giving up meat, which is central to celebrations, and spirituality. That's a challenge for many African vegans, including Vijo. Her father runs a cattle farm, and they've debated the high cost of giving up his business, which supports a community in Zimbabwe. In African culture, a big part of a family's net worth is their livestock. Their livestock define the wealth of a family, and so when you slaughter an animal at a gathering, it's seen as you giving of yourself. Um, Whereas getting some vegetables from your veggie patch it doesn't really equate to the same amount of giving. So I think that that's still something that I think the African continent as a whole will need to grapple with when it comes. And I think that's, that's one of the barriers to veganism for people of, of, African, of African cultures. But some are finding a middle path. 31-year-old Tandiwe Ngubeni, a communications specialist, still eats meat but less and less of it as time goes by. I feel way more energized when I eat a, a vegetarian or vegan meal. It actually just gives me more energy. Seki, who has been vegan since 2017, endorses the slow and steady approach. There's no right way of doing anything. I think, yes, there are many benefits of being vegan, especially for the animals, especially for the animals in terms of them being killed and all of that. But if you, this is a choice that only you can make. Instead, she says, just take it one bite at a time. Anita Powell, BOA News, Johannesburg. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, what's behind the boost in Kenya's stock exchange? We'll be back.
I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Michael Sunday is admiring his new right hand, a silicone glove-like prosthetic. The artist behind the creation is John Amanam, a 32-year-old former movie special effects expert. He developed an interest in prosthetics after a family member lost a limb in an accident. Amanam has no formal training in making prosthetics, but studied sculpting as an art student. The pieces are sold for around $111. His company, Immortal Cosmetic Art, is part of a growing services industry that has helped Nigeria's economy become the biggest in Africa. Amanam says a mismatched skin tone makes it more difficult for people to feel confident with their artificial limbs. Next up, after a bruising 2019 in which it lost its tech unicorn crown and pulled back from three countries, Africa Focus Jumia Incorporated says it is back in fighting form. The head of a company dubbed Africa's Amazon says that the e-commerce ecosystem it built, including an online payment platform, a logistics network, and a range of services for sellers, will lead them to the black before investors lose patience. Jumia has a ways to go. After becoming the first African tech firm to list in New York in April with a value of over $1 billion, Jumia's shares tumbled after short seller Citron Research cast doubt on Jumia's sales figures. Late last year, it shut its e-commerce service from Cameroon and Tanzania and nixed its food delivery service in Rwanda. And finally, researchers from Stanford University have developed a winged robot that mimics the way birds fly and could inspire the next generation of flying robots. Rather than flapping, the pigeon bot's wings use a morphing technique like real bird wings, along with a propeller and tail, like a conventional aircraft. The team hopes that the morphing ability of pigeon bot could pave the way for creating more agile aircraft and help shape the future of drone design. And that's what's trending today. In other world news, day three of the impeachment trial of U.S. President Donald Trump resumes Thursday afternoon. On Tuesday, congressional Democrats accused President Trump Wednesday of designing a corrupt scheme to pressure Ukraine into investigating his leading 2020 election rival, former Vice President Joe Biden. In the first day of opening arguments before the 100 U.S. senators weighing if Trump should be removed from office, Congressman Adam Schiff declared the vote on articles of impeachment would decide America's standing around the world. The U.S. congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson reports from Capitol Hill. Impeachment managers on their way to the U.S. Senate after days of ceremony and procedural fights, making their opening argument Trump's guilt is clear. President Trump withheld hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid to a strategic partner at war with Russia to secure foreign help with his re-election, in other words, to cheat. In this way, the president used official state powers available only to him and unavailable to any political opponent to advantage himself in a Democratic election. Democrats say there is even more evidence to be uncovered, but failed in their initial attempt Tuesday to force Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to call witnesses at the beginning of the trial. The very first thing the American people saw when they tuned into the impeachment trial of President Trump was Republican senators voting against having a fair trial with relevant evidence. The impeachment trial of President Trump begins with a cloud hanging over it cloud of unfairness. Connell said no decision about witnesses until opening arguments are over. 
but could end up bowing to the majority of Americans who want witnesses called. He understands that if it looks like a fake trial, that would be bad from a public opinion standpoint and could be harmful to the party in November. So he wants it to look like a trial in the sense that uh, there are opening statements uh, from each side. Uh, the senators have a chance to ask uh, questions. Uh, but of course, he doesn't want the trial to go on indefinitely, and he wants there to be an acquittal in the end. A marathon day of arguments against Trump appeared to change few minds. The main dynamic that's going to change is what happens when the president makes his case. So, of course, we haven't heard that yet. Uh, I'm anxious to see what happens then. And uh, my gut is that since we haven't heard that version, that that's going to be a game changer. Trump's lawyers set to begin their defense Saturday. But the president's allies are already accusing Democrats of using the impeachment process for political gain. When it comes to Donald Trump, they're willing to destroy the institution of the office in the name of getting him. Democrats have two more days for their opening arguments. But a battle over allowing White House officials to testify in return for the testimony of former Vice President Joe Biden is already brewing. That's not a trade. Uh, trials aren't trades for witnesses. They want to use this trial to smear the Bidens. That's not the purpose of the trial, and the senators should not allow it to be abused in that way. If McConnell doesn't change his stance or a deal isn't reached, it would mark the first Senate impeachment trial without witnesses. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. President Trump is criticizing airline manufacturing giant Boeing because of its problems after the grounding of the 737 MAX plane following two deadly crashes. Trump told the American cable network CNBC Wednesday that taking the planes out of service has had a knock-on effect for the U.S. economy. Trump says that Boeing is a big disappointment to him. The 737 MAX was grounded worldwide in March 2019 after two crashes claimed the lives of 346 people. On Tuesday, Boeing officially pushed back the time frame for the 737 MAX to return to the skies. The move sent shares plunging and overshadowing an early announcement of a first flight of the grounded 737 plane. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence joins nearly 50 world leaders attending the World Holocaust Forum in Jerusalem Thursday to mark the 75th anniversary of the Allies' liberation of the Auschwitz concentration camp at the end of World War II. More than one million people, most of them Jewish, died at the camp in German-occupied Poland during the Holocaust as part of the Nazis' campaign to exterminate Jews. The gathering comes amid an increase in anti-Semitism in both Europe and the United States. Here's Linda Grunstein in Jerusalem. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence joins the likes of Russian President Vladimir Putin, the President of France, and Britain's Prince Charles. In an ancient city where tension is the norm, the security challenge is massive. The majority of the area in Jerusalem, in fact, with uh, emphasis on the area of Yad Vashem, will be on lockdown. The perimeter will be uh, closed 360 degrees with security services and under undercover officers that will be working in order to prevent any major incident from taking place in the area. In preparation for the arriving dignitaries, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel will never forget the lessons of the Holocaust. I think the lesson of Auschwitz is, one, stop bad things when they're small, and Iran is a very bad thing. It's not that small, but it could get a lot bigger with nuclear weapons, and I think the first thing is stop that. And second, understand, that the Jews will never, ever again be defenseless in the face of those who want to destroy them. The modern state of Israel was born after the lessons of the Holocaust in Europe. Israelis hope this gathering will serve not only as a reminder of that, but as a catalyst for change in international policy. The mere fact that it's happening is already important, and that whatever they'll be saying, I haven't seen the text, but there'll be some text that they'll that they, all these leaders will commit themselves to about remembering the Holocaust and fighting anti-Semitism. I mean, think about it, 75 years after the Holocaust that we have to talk about a wave of anti-Semitism is terrifying in its own right. What I'd like to see, though, is not just that they say that, which is important in its own right, but that they actually take it seriously. The growing tide of anti-Semitism in Europe and the U.S. is causing alarm here in Israel. 
In France, the number of anti-Jewish crimes rose 74 percent last year. The U.S. has also seen a steep rise of anti-Semitic attacks throughout the country. And the feeling is, and I think that's, it's, it's a genuine feeling and it's correct, that more has to be invested in education about the Holocaust and education against racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, etc., to try and limit these crimes. Zoroff and others hope this commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz will inspire world leaders to take a stronger stand against hatred and prevent a repeat. Linda Gradstein for VOA News, Jerusalem. Central banks in Ghana, Kenya and Nigeria are leaving interest rates stable in the coming days as they keep an eye on inflation and wait to see how an initial U.S.-China trade deal pans out, according to a Reuters poll on Wednesday. Economists say interest rates in Africa, which rank second in size and population among the world's continents, remain too high for consumers and businesses to access. The chief executive of Nairobi's Securities Exchange expects the removal of a cap on commercial lending rates to spur stock trading, lift valuations and attract new listings. Serena Chondry has more in this business report. The chief executive of Kenya's stock exchange says he believes 2020 will be a positive year, with the removal of a government cap on commercial lending expected to spur stocks trading, lift valuations and attract new listings. In an interview with Reuters on Monday, Jeffrey Odundo, head of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, said investors would potentially shift from fixed income into stocks. We provide a more affordable opportunity for raising money uh, because uh, banks now can actually have I've got a free opportunity to, to lend at new rates that they, they desire. And so investors are likely to look at equity as an alternative to, to tap into or to raise capital to run their businesses. Kenya's stock exchange is a key entry point for foreign investors seeking exposure to East Africa's fast-growing economies. But despite being the fifth largest on the continent, the number of companies listed on the bourse have remained at around 65 for many years, with a combined worth of $24.6 billion. It's since been trying to change that with an incubator program launched in December 2018 to prepare young firms for eventual listing or bond issuance. Odundo said 24 companies had so far been admitted onto the platform. Serena Chondry of Reuters with that report. And that wraps up our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.